Hi, I'm Dr. Peterson with Region ZMS. Alcohol intoxication, drug ingestions, and intentional overdoses seem to be a common theme for many 911 calls. Fortunately, most of the time the treatment is simply supportive care with IV fluids and airway monitoring. Occasionally, there is a reason to intervene, and I'd like to take a few minutes to review the toxicology-related guidelines to highlight a few situations that you should keep in mind. Now, one of the most important points to keep in mind when dealing with a suspected ingestion is that the patient is usually not giving you truthful information. I hate to generalize this, but it's really true. A couple of beers doesn't put you at a 0.26 blood alcohol level. Similarly, in the emergency department, we evaluate for several different types of ingestions, the most common of which is Tylenol. I say this to emphasize the fact that it is important to transport all intentional ingestions to the hospital for evaluation and monitoring. For unintentional ingestions, medical control and the poison control center would be helpful resources. Let's look at guideline 28, the adult overdose and toxic ingestion guideline. The pediatric version, guideline 51, is very similar. The most important intervention would be to assess and manage your patient's airway. With the approval of naloxone for use by first responders, there has been a lot of recent media exposure to heroin and other opiate overdoses. It is important to remember that the first treatment for an opiate overdose is to ventilate the patient. Naloxone should be given and titrated to an adequate respiratory drive, but you should continue to ventilate your patient in case there are additional substances on board or another medical condition. Once the airway has been secured, Administer IV fluids to maintain adequate perfusion, typically a systolic blood pressure of at least 90. An EKG should also be obtained in all ingestions, as the electrical conduction through the heart can clue us in as to what kind of medications may have been ingested. The most important things to look for would be the corrected QT interval, which should be less than 500 milliseconds, and the QRS width which for toxicology purposes should be less than 100 milliseconds instead of 120 milliseconds for a bundle branch block. If the corrected QT interval is longer than 500 milliseconds, two grams of magnesium sulfate should be given via slow IV push. If the QRS width is longer than 100 milliseconds and you suspect an ingestion of tricyclic antidepressants, your patient's risk of seizures and critical arrhythmias due to sodium channel conduction blockade increases significantly. If this is noted, you should give 2 amps of sodium bicarbonate, or 1 milli equivalent per kilogram for pediatric patients, every 5 minutes until the QRS narrows. The other concerning ingestion would be beta blocker or calcium channel blocker medications. Calcium chloride, glucagon, and transcutaneous pacing should be considered for unstable patients. And I would highly recommend contacting MRCC as early as possible for medical control involvement with these patients. Also, whenever possible, obtain an estimated time frame of ingestion from family members or friends and gather any empty pill bottles for transport to the ER with the patient. Another aspect of toxicology is the management of bites and envenomations, described in Guideline 69. There are some old-fashioned treatment ideas that should not be used anymore, so if you encounter a bitten patient with a tourniquet in place, remove it immediately unless it was placed for hemorrhage control. Next, manage any life-threatening injuries or anaphylactic reactions per the appropriate guideline. Finally, provide supportive care of the wound with pain control, elevation to a neutral elevation, splinting, and ice packs. If you are safely able to identify or photograph the animal or creature, this is always helpful. And consider contacting law enforcement to take a report if not already done. The next two guidelines we will review are the carbon monoxide and cyanide exposure guidelines. Let's start with carbon monoxide, guideline 70. This should be used whenever the situation suggests prolonged exposure to products of combustion, such as a car in a garage, a generator, or a furnace, especially when multiple people in the same enclosed space are symptomatic. Smoke inhalation would be another consideration. 
protect yourself first and call for additional resources to initiate ambient air monitoring if appropriate and available. If a Massimo carboxyhemoglobin detector is available, anyone who measures under 5% without symptoms can safely be cleared from this guideline. Between 5 and 10% without symptoms can also be cleared unless the patient is pregnant or a pediatric patient. Anyone who can't be cleared by this guideline should be provided 100% oxygen via a non-rebreather mask and transported to a hospital for further evaluation. If carbon monoxide exposure is the only concern, excluding smoke inhalation, contact MRCC for assistance in determining the appropriate destination hospital, as it may be appropriate to directly transport these patients to the regional hyperbaric chamber, which would be at Hennepin County Medical Center in Minneapolis. Next, let's look at guideline 71, the cyanide exposure guideline. There are two situations to consider here, smoke inhalation and direct exposure to cyanide, such as would be found in some Southeast Asian metal polishes. The treatment for cyanide exposure should be given as soon as possible. This is an extremely time-sensitive intervention. Unfortunately, most agencies under the medical direction of Region EMS are not currently carrying hydroxocobalamin, also known as a cyanokit. So rapid transport to a local hospital would be the treatment of choice. If a cyanokit is available on scene, it should only be given for confirmed exposures with altered mental status, cardiac arrest, or signs of shock with hemodynamic instability. Administration of a cyanokit requires a separate dedicated IV site and must be reconstituted per the instructions on the container insert. As always, contact MRCC for guidance in applying this guideline to your patient. The last guideline I would like to review in this video is Guideline 72, the Weapons of Mass Destruction Nerve Agent Exposure Guideline. This guideline should be used whenever there is suspicion of nerve agent deployment and symptoms are present. These treatments should not be given for asymptomatic patients as they do not have any use in the prophylactic setting. Commonly, these patients or responders will develop the sludge symptoms, also known as the cholinergic toxidrome. Sludge stands for salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation, gastrointestinal upset, and emesis. The most critical concern would be the respiratory symptoms, and if repeated doses of atropine are given, they should be titrated until the respiratory symptoms improve. The treatment for a cholinergic toxidrome is two milligrams of atropine with 600 milligrams of pralidoxime given any route, IM, IV, or IO. Two doses should be given rapidly for minor symptoms, three doses for major symptoms. This will quickly exhaust your atropine supply in a single ambulance, so if there are multiple patients with symptoms, you should notify MRCC to activate hospital decontamination protocols, mobilize pharmacy resources to release atropine at the receiving hospital, and even to consider releasing a metro area chem pack, which would contain additional medications to be used on scene for mass casualty situations. Keep in mind that your safety is the most important consideration. And as always, involve medical control early for treatment advice and triage priorities.